Father, we thank you this morning that we can read your word, the Bible. Thank you that we can do so publicly without fear. And so, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us now, that we would make the most of this opportunity to allow you to speak to our hearts, that we might be made to become more like Jesus. These things we ask in his name. Amen. Here we are. We made it. In fact, I've got you a certificate. It should be on your seat. 24 weeks. This is the 24th. This is for you to prove that you did the course. You stayed till the end. Now, you may have only joined us part way through because there have been people, of course, who started this with us. Life has changed. There are some people who are no longer with us. They've gone home since we started this series back in June 22. But there's people who've joined us along the way. But here we are. We are still is, is serving the Lord as Christians in an ever increasingly challenging world for us. And today we come to the end of the book. And I think today is a challenging and dramatic conclusion. After all the excitement and all the battles and all the things that have been taking place, today we come to this dramatic but challenging conclusion. Second slide, please, Soph. So the last two weeks we've been looking at speeches of Joshua. The first one, as we know, was to the eastern tribes before they went off, and they spoke, uh, he spoke to them before they disappeared east of the Jordan again. And then last week he was speaking to the leaders and the elders in order that they might be prepared to go and tell the people. But now, this time, this speech was to the whole of the nation. Because it's a time for renewal of the covenant between God and them. And verse 1 sets the scene for us. Joshua summons them. But notice this, he summons them to a place, but where did they come and what did they do? It tells us that they presented themselves, not before Joshua, but before God. And all through this book we've said, haven't we, that this is not a book, even though it bears his name, about Joshua. It's not even about the people of Israel. It's about the God of Joshua and the people of Israel. Joshua is merely the mouthpiece of God. And this morning, I've got to tell you, it's exactly the same. We're summoned and we're assembled here and we stand before God. We're not here this morning, you'll be pleased to know, to hear me. But if I'm obedient to what God wants, then what you will hear this morning is the word of God. Because I'm merely the mouthpiece, as Joshua was merely the mouthpiece of what God wanted to say. And that matters. It matters because what I say is the Lord's word. It's not from me, but from the Lord. So we listen attentively and carefully to what is contained in this final speech of Joshua as he speaks, as God speaks this morning to you and to me. And the whole of this series has been building up to this final moment, to this final challenge that we're going to face this morning. Slide number three, so please. We learn in verse one where all this takes place, a place called Shechem. And we've been here before. A lot has happened at Shechem. Because around 600 years before this event that we're reading about today, Abraham, who'd been called by God, the original covenant you remember from our series when we looked at Abraham those years ago, God gave the covenant promise to Abraham. And he said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. From you there will be a great nation come who will be my people Israel. And then he went on his journey, he brought him out of the land, uh, over the river Euphrates, and he travelled through the land, and he got to the land of Canaan. It wasn't there as yet, but he was travelling through it, and he comes to a place at Shechem again, and God speaks to him again. He says, Abraham, the land that you're in, this is all going to be your people's. One day, your descendants are going to inherit this land. It's going to be yours. And he was so impressed, Abraham, that he builds an altar there at Shechem to remember that this was the place where God promised that the land where they were was one day going to be their descendants. Since that time, jo Jacob also had an interest in the land. He bought some land there and he too built an altar there. And you and I, we visited there way back in Joshua chapter 8. Do you remember when they renewed the covenant after the debacle at Ai? They caused so many problems there. They had to renew the covenant between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal at the place called Shechem. So much happened at this place called Shechem. And down those 600 years, the people would have passed on what had happened at this place. It was a place that they would have passed on and said, look, do you remember Abraham? He told him there that this is where the land was going to be. 
and so on and so forth. And down the ages, the people would have remembered it. Can you imagine how they felt that day? After all that time passed on through six centuries, there they were stood at the very place where God had told Abraham that this land was going to be theirs one day. And 600 years had passed and God had kept his promise. And they were the people. They were there. They were stood on that same sacred ground. They now lived in the land. Isn't it amazing? God keeping his promises. Right throughout all that time. It may take time, but God kept his promises. Every one was fulfilled. And he even took them back to the very place. The very place where he told Abraham it was going to happen. Well, this speech is leading to the renewal of that covenant once again at Shechem. Joshua is now near the very end of his life. And he wants the nation now living in the land once more to commit their way to God, their collective life to God. In the ancient Near East, there were different types of covenants, principally two different types between, made between parties. One type was between it governed relationships, which were of an equal nature, and another type of covenant sort of governed relationship between unequal parties. So somebody who was superior and somebody who was inferior, perhaps because they'd taken that land or they were a lord or something like that. And these different types of contracts had a specific type of formula. They'd go through and they'd list all the, the things that they'd done for you know, the other party, and then it would come to the point of challenge, and then there'd be the point of agreement and so on. And it's said by people far clever and I that this this speech is actually based on that same formula of the contract it, it's like they're going to sign up if you like to this to this whole covenant idea between their relationship with God now you know this week that Sarah had a car accident thank you so much for all your love prayer and support and as a result of this accident I had to read um, some contracts you know to for a hire car do you know I started reading a small print I began to wonder whether it was actually signing a contract for a hire car or, or there was some procurement agreement for a nuclear submarine because the, the detail of it was just unbelievable and, and it gets very, very complex. But this covenant, this, this of Joshua, it's not complicated at all. It's really straightforward and it's simple. Number four, please, Soph. Well, the covenant starts with Joshua speaking for God. Very clearly, he speaks for God. And he's reminding the nation of all that God has done for them. And in a dozen verses, he covers 600 years of history of the people of Israel. And throughout this brief time of history, time and time again, we read of God's involvement in the life of the nation. And as Joshua speaks for God, he reminds them of all that God has done. He says, I took Abraham, I gave him Isaac, I sent Moses and Aaron, I sent the plagues into Egypt, I brought them out of Egypt, I brought you to the land, I gave them into your hands, I delivered you. The entire history was all about God's covenant grace. It was all about what God had done for them despite their unfaithfulness to him. Abraham Remember, there was examples in this. He himself was brought out of a pagan land. In those 12 verses, there's three examples of how God, despite, you know, he'd done all these things, but there's three times he refers to their unfaithful past. You know, when spiritually they'd not been where they should have been. Abraham himself was called out of a pagan land where he worshipped pagan gods. He reminded them of the influence of the Egyptian gods when they, when they were there enslaved in that land. He reminded them of the time that they're now there with the pagan gods in, amongst the Canaanites. And he reminded them of the, the dalliance that they'd had with those gods. And yet despite it all, in spite of all of that, God had remained faithful and delivered his people. And, and he goes on in verse 13 and he says, you know, the land that you've got, he, he sums it up, doesn't he? He says, the land is land for which you didn't toil. It's cities that you didn't build. It's, you're eating from vineyards and olive groves that you didn't plant. He basically is telling them that I did all this for you. I provided it. I gave it to you. It's out of my grace that you have benefited. This is nothing of yourselves. So the start of the covenant states what God has done for them. And isn't it good to be reminded of all the blessings, blessings that come from God's abundant grace and isn't the same for you and I this morning because we can look back on our lives can't we we live in a, in a pagan world as it were living in a world that loves to worship pagan gods 
gods of power, of success, of money, of sex, you know, all these gods around us in the world. And we lived like Abraham in that sort of land and we had no hope, we had no future, we had no lasting peace, no real joy. And into that situation steps God. God moves into our lives. And time and time again, we can hear in our own experience, I called you out of that life. I, I, I gave you, I led you away. I, I made it possible. I gave you my only son, Jesus. I opened the way up for you for eternal life. It's me who did it for you. God's covenant grace. And yet sadly, as we look back on that long list of things in our own lives that God has done for us, the blessings which are ours, we're reminded, aren't we, of those times when we have worshipped our own pagan gods. When we turned away from the one true living God. And today, of course, those same pagan gods are the ones that still cause the greatest threat to you and I and the church's relationship with God. And you may say this morning, oh, Peter, come on, I don't worship pagan gods. Surely not. Don't we? I think we do. What about those things in your life which you attach greater importance to than you do to God? How about while you spend your time choosing what you would rather do rather than doing what God wants you to do? Preserving and protecting time for the things that matter most to us and yet spending no time or very little time in prayer or reading our Bibles. Choosing to spend our time for ourselves and for the things that are more important to us than God. How do you spend your money? What about that money that we spend not thinking twice about a sum for something that we desire, and yet perhaps giving little or nothing to God, failing to remember that it's all from him and all his anyway? How about your career? Prioritising something that suits you, a lifestyle that's going to give you, without even asking what God wants from your life. And how about those things that really reveal what we're really like? You know, we sing, don't we, that song... I surrender all, I surrender all. And yet sometimes I think I sing it, I won't speak for you, too glibly. Because all too soon I forget about the pride, about the anger, about the lust, about the covetousness. Do I really surrender all? Yes, I think we do. We worship other gods, don't we? And it's only the grace of God that can save us. And what, makes, what God makes clear through his mouthpiece to Josh, of Joshua is that he knows that they worship other gods. He knows that they have put other things before him. And yet God says very clearly, I chose Israel. I delivered Israel. I rescued Israel. I empowered Israel. I enriched Israel. And the evidence is laid out in those 13 verses that reminds Israel from their history of the truth of what God has done. And in exactly the same way, God knows when you and I put other things before him. He knows. He knows our hearts. He knows when we choose those other things. And yet he still pours out his grace because he loves us and he wants us to be his. Slide number five, please, Sophie. So the covenant moves on. It moves on from this is what God has done, this is what's happened, and this is what you've done. So now, the challenge. Verse 14. Fear the Lord. Joshua makes it very clear, this is the contract, this is what you've got to do. Fear the Lord. Serve him with faithfulness. Throw away the gods that your forefathers worshipped beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. In comes the challenge. This is what you need to do, Israel. In view of all that God has done for you, the right and proper response you need to make to God is this. It could not be clearer. It could not be clearer. This is the covenant you've got to have to sign. And friends, this morning, it couldn't be any clearer for you and I either. We need to revere our holy God. We need to serve him faithfully. We need to get rid of every part of our lives that we place as more important than God. Get rid of it. Throw it away and serve the Lord. Live your life in service for our holy God and prioritise him in every area of your life. 
But then interestingly, Joshua gives them a choice. He gives them a choice in verse 15. He says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the river Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now living. Did you notice that? Did he get that choice that he was offering to them? And to you and I in a sense? He says, serve the Lord, but if you choose not to do that, then choose either the gods from beyond the river or some other sort of gods. You see, I think we get it in our heads that we can somehow choose to follow God, but not quite completely. And somehow that doesn't make us quite as bad as some of these other people who don't worship God at all. You know, we, in fact, we create for ourselves some sort of in-between option. We think there's an in-between option where we can, we can serve God, but we can still hold on to some of the things that we want to do and, and live the life in the way that we choose, which is not the way that God chooses, but because we've chosen partly God, well, then we're okay. There's some sort of middle ground. No, that's not what Joshua was saying. We either worship the God or we choose to worship some other God. Because make no mistake, we will be worshipping some sort of God, whether it's the gods that we create in our own lives, or whether we worship the one true living God. You've heard this story before, but I like it, so I'm going to tell it you again. It's a story about the chicken and the pig. And they were walking down the road, as they do together, because they like each other, because they're both off a farm. And they're walking down this road, chatting away, and they see outside this church on the notice board the forthcoming title for the pastor's sermon for the following Sunday. And the title is, What Can We Do to Help the Poor? And as pigs and chickens are want to do, they carry on walking down the road and they enter into this earnest conversation, trying to, you know, work out what the answer to that thing is, until the chicken cackles into life and she says, I've got it. I've got it, she says. We can help the poor by giving them a bacon and eggs breakfast. Whoa, hang on a minute, says the pig. For you, that's only making a contribution. But for me, that's total commitment. That's total commitment. The question you've got to answer this morning is are you totally committed or are you merely making a contribution? You see, the choice that we're given is either total commitment or we're worshipping gods, other gods of our own making. And you know, there's a saying that's attributed to Augustine. You've probably heard this before. It says, if Jesus Christ is not Lord of all in my life, then he's not really Lord at all. Let me say that again. If Jesus Christ is not Lord of all, then he's not really Lord at all. And then the great leader, Joshua, the one who we followed and he set an example, he does it again. He sets by his own personal example and he states his personal position. A position which today you can see it on cushions, on clocks, on key fobs, on plaques, in Christian homes around the world. You could probably quote it yourself because he says, but as for me, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. A man confident in God. To the extent that he could commit his way wholeheartedly, all in, no question, all in. The evidence of the past was enough for Joshua to know that he was all in with God. God was good enough and God was first in his life and God was first in the life of his family. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord, says Joshua. And he stood there before the great nation, picture the scene. What was the response going to be? The challenge to commitment is laid out before them. He stated his position. Will they sign the contract? Will they sign on the dotted line? What was going to be the outcome? And then the reply. Yes. Yes, we're in Joshua. They acknowledge what God has done for them. And then they declare, we too will serve the Lord. Because he is our God. Brilliant. Brilliant. If this was a blockbuster film, you can imagine the closing scene. You know, they're all stood there. The sun's shining, the smiling, the rejoicing. And the camera cuts across to this satisfied smile on Joshua's face as, it, as he sees his life work. Yes, they're in. It's all worked out. And then it probably cuts straight to his funeral scene and the end of the story and the end of Joshua and the end of the film. But that's not what happens. It's not what happens. What does Joshua do? Listen again to what he says. He says to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord. You're not able to serve the Lord. He's a holy God. He's a jealous God. He'll not forgive your rebellion and sins. 
If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he'll turn and he'll bring disaster on you and make an end of you, even after he's been good to you. Oh, no, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Let's just back up. Josh, you laid out the covenant. You told us the choice. We heard your choice. Uh, and we made our choice the same as you. And now you're telling us that we're not able to do that. What's going on, Joshua? Joshua knows that this is just about as big a decision as that they are ever going to have to make. He knows it's not a decision that cannot be taken lightly. And he wants them to understand that God is holy. He is a jealous God. He expects exclusive devotion to him. And they could lose everything if they don't mean what they're committing to. He wants them to pause he wants them to pause and to think and to realise that they can't do this on their own. If they try, they will fail. No question. They must understand that they have to rely on the grace of God in order to please and worship God. And he tells them that this is not a decision to be made lightly. Jump forward all those years to Jesus. Remember how he's in our series, he was wandering around journeys with Jesus we looked at in Luke's Gospel. Things had been going really well for Jesus. There was great crowds following him. There were people witnessing his miracles and they wanted to listen to his teaching. It was revolutionary, it was new and he was attracting many, many people to him. And then in the mirror of it, mirror of it all, he stops and he presses the pause button. And in Luke chapter 14 he states very clearly and he starts telling them who cannot be his disciple and he says to the crowds and the disciples said if you don't put me first even more than your mum and dad and your brother and sister and your family if you're not prepared to put me first then you cannot be my disciple and if you're not prepared to pick up your cross every day and carry it for me you cannot be my disciple no question it's either total commitment or you're not in at all. There's no half and half. Jesus made it absolutely clear. If you don't do that, you cannot be my disciple. And Joshua and Jesus, they're making it clear to us. They're making the message this morning simple. It's either total commitment. We're either all in, God first, Jesus first, or we're not. And just so we're clear, this is not about turning people off following Jesus. This is, this is not Joshua trying to turn him away from God or, or Jesus trying to turn you and me away from following him. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. It's exactly the opposite because by putting God first in our lives and above all else, God knows the benefits that it is to you and I when we do that. He knows then that it's then that we, we, we experience life in all its fullness where we experience hope and peace and joy and, and we get every blessing, every promise fulfilled. It's when we put God first that it's then that God is able to bless us, to use us and the same for us as a church because when we put him first, he can pour in his spirit and use us as his church to bless the people of Appleton and Appleton Cross and beyond. And God will be able to use us for his glory. You know, we're already blessed and we've already talked about this recently. Make no mistake, we are blessed as a church, but by far the greatest blessing comes when we are totally committed, when we are all in, all in for Jesus, just as Joshua instructs the people of Israel. So what did they reply? No, we will serve the Lord, the nation replied. We understand, total commitment, we're all in. Number six, please, Sophie. So Joshua is taking them as far as he can. He's preparing the contract for everybody to, to be on board with this covenant. They were all going to be witnesses to the commitment that they were making. He had it written down. And as all that was taking place, then Joshua says probably the most challenging thing that he said to date. Now then, he says, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. You see, words are worthless, aren't they? Words are worthless unless they're followed up by actions. You've said that you'll serve God only, so now go and do it. Throw away the gods. Get rid of all that you put before God in your life. I surrender all. 
I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Saviour, I surrender all. We sing it, we may even think that we mean it, but when we go home, do we really, do we really surrender all? Will your words be turned into actions? Will you turn out and throw away every last thing in your life that stands before you, between you and putting God first in your life? Will you surrender your marriage into the hands of God? Will you surrender your family into the hands of God, your career, your home, your car, your money, your leisure time, your anger, your lust, your covetousness? Will you serve God and his church in the way that he wants you to do? Get rid of the lot, says Joshua. You sign in the covenant, you sign the contract, get rid of it. Get rid of all of it. And in verse 24, the people responded again. They said, we will serve the Lord and obey him. Great. But did you notice what they didn't say? Do you notice what they didn't say and they subsequently didn't do? On a previous occasion when they've been challenged like this about the gods, they actually took the gods, the physical gods, and they buried them in the ground. They got rid of them. But they didn't do that here, did they? Nowhere do we read that they got the gods that they've been worshipping in the land that they were and buried them in the ground. And neither did they say that they would either. And of course we know from reading on in God's word that it came back to the nation and caused them huge problems. Problems which you could even say we're still seeing in the Middle East even today. So what action do you need to take? And crucially, will you take it? Or like with Israel, will it cause you huge problems down the line in your life? Because make no mistake, words are not enough. Action is required. God demands it. If Jesus Christ is not Lord of all, then he's not really Lord at all. On that very day, Joshua made the covenant at Shechem. Slide number seven, please, Soph. He draws up the decrees and the laws, and Joshua recorded it all in the book of the law of God. He even got a large stone to stand as a witness to the occasion and to the agreement. The contract, if you like, the covenant was signed. They were witnesses to it. Friends, if you're going to get rid of all the gods in your life and all the idols, if that's the commitment that you're prepared to make today, how will you record it? Can I suggest that you take the piece of paper that's been on your seat and you go home and you write on it, today, the 20 whatever date it is of October, uh, that I'm not the 20th, the 16th, that on this day, I surrendered X, Y, Z to God. I gave up the idols, I got rid of them out of my life and slip it in your Bible. And then when you're tempted, you know, to, for those gods and idols to come back into your life, to get it out, to remind yourself of the commitment that you made today, that you're going to let nothing stand between you and God. And how about erecting a memorial like they did? They did a stone. Why don't you get a cross? A cross that stands as a witness of what God has done for you. And what you're committing to do for him. Put it in a prominent place where you'll see it every day. So it reminds you that you are totally committed, that you're all in for Jesus, that God is your everything on every day of the week. Joshua sent the people away to their inheritance to go and enjoy all that God had promised them and, and, and to be blessed as God had delivered on his promise. Slide number eight, please, Soph. And then in verse 29, it says this, as we rapidly come to the end of this morning and we come to the end of the series, it says in verse 29, after these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. Joshua, the great leader, dies. But I want us to notice something really, really important. All through the book of Joshua, the great man Moses has been referred to as the servant of the Lord. And right back at the beginning, when Joshua was appointed to take on the work of, of Moses as the leader of the nation, he was referred to as the assistant to Moses. Subsequent to that, all through the book of Joshua, Joshua has been referred to as Joshua. But now, at his funeral service, the epitaph slipped into verse 29, those five words, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord. If Joshua did write the book that bears his name, we said at the start he couldn't have written all of it. You can't write about your own funeral because it hasn't happened yet. Someone else did, under the divine hand of God, wrote and recorded that Joshua was a servant of God. 
What will people say about you at your funeral service when you have gone? What do you hope they'll say? He was a great person, rich, powerful, clever, lived an amazing life. Or how about the accolade? They were a servant of the Lord. You see, the former accolades, they speak of the things that the world makes gods out of, don't they? But we should be striving towards, longing to hear that God says he was a servant of the Lord. What a privilege to be known as a servant of God. Someone whose life is characterised by service for our holy God. Someone who's followed God, given their life to God. That's what we should be hoping for, that's said at our funeral service, just as it was said at Joshua's. All his life, and in the final analysis, he was known as the servant of the Lord. Slide number nine, please. We learn that Joshua is buried in the land, and his legacy in verse 31 tells us that he, that all that he'd done, and all those people who had been his elders during that time, they continued to obey the Lord. That his legacy continued for that part of that generation. Those who'd seen it, they continued it. But beyond that, we know in another book from the Bible that that's not what happened. They soon forgot and they turned back and they started worshipping idols. And then the very last part of the book, it records two more burials. The bones of Joseph were brought up out of Egypt. And Eliezer, who had been his assistant to Joshua, the, the bones brought up out of Egypt. That's another promise kept, wasn't it? You know, Joshua on his deathbed said, when you, when you get to the promised land, he said, I want you to take my bones and I want you to bury them. And they did. They buried them at Shechem, an important place again, isn't it? Because that was the sort of headquarters between Ephraim and Manasseh, the tribes of them, who were both his sons. Another promise kept by God. And then we leave the funeral service of Joshua to the, the servant of the Lord and we prepare now to say goodbye to him, at least for now. Joshua's work is complete. The nation is where God wanted them and, and Joshua had done as much as he could to ensure that future generations enjoyed the land that they had been promised. I guess the question that Joshua might have lay there on his deathbed with was this. Would they squander or would they develop what Joshua had left behind. What now for us this morning? Slide number 10, please. What now for you? Will you develop or will you squander what Joshua has given to us through the example of his life as we've looked at it again in this series? Right at the start of our Joshua journey, we said that the whole book could be summed up in one verse. Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. There it is. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. We've seen this to be true right throughout the life of Joshua and the nation of Israel. All through all the 24 chapters. And hopefully we've seen it through our own lives as well. As we've stopped and we've considered how God has blessed us too. And as he keeps his promise. And as we conclude, this week has really been about God keeping his promises as you and I make a choice. And you have to, don't you? Because even if you choose not to make a choice, you're still making a choice. So choose this day who you will serve. And I hope that along with me, relying completely upon the grace of God, that we will, like Joshua, all of us, say that we will serve the Lord and in doing so that we will see our God keeping his promises in our lives just as we've seen he did in the life of Joshua. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father we thank you for the life of Joshua. We thank you for the series that we have gone through in the book bearing his name. We thank you Lord that throughout it we can see that you are a God who keeps his promises. Father, we pray this morning that we, like Joshua, would commit our way to you. That in great confidence of a holy God, we will come to you, throw ourselves on your mercy and through your grace, know that we can be your people. Lord, help us to get rid of every idol, of every pagan God, of everything in our lives that we put as more important than you. And I pray, Lord, that today that we as individuals and as a church will commit that to you today. That our lives might be once again covenanted, committed, signed, sealed and delivered in the service of our loving Heavenly Father. 
Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless us as a church as a result. That we would see you fulfilling your promises as we seek to serve you. That one day we will be known as we stand before you as servants of the living God. Help us to that end, we pray today. To put you first and every day. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.